Professor Brasseur, thank you very much. And Director General Pavel Kabat of IASA, a most remarkable institution. And I hope everybody in Vienna is very proud of uh, being a neighbor of this uh, unique and world-renowned institution. And Professor and President uh, Franz uh, Fischler, uh, President uh, uh, of Austria and President uh, of, uh, of uh, the European uh, Forum, Albach. Um, what a great honor it is to be together with you this evening. And I want to thank you for turning out for some brainstorming together. We wouldn't be here if we weren't in a bit of a mess. I'm not going to give you uh, simple answers to simple questions because the questions are very complicated and the answers do not quite exist. But I hope that I can give some clarification about the challenges of sustainable development and also some reasons for hope and some clarity about what a path to sustainable development for the entire planet might mean. I wish we were on that path now. We are not. Uh, we have serious and unmet challenges that will intensify in the future. We have not yet shown our capacity as a species and as a, a global political system and increasingly a global society to face these realities with the kind of clarity and expertise and division of labor and effectiveness that we do in many other spheres of life. In a way, many of the problems that we face are problems of our triumph, after all. If we were not so good at producing things, if we were not so good at extracting things, if we were not so good after 300 years of modern science at growing food and sustaining a planet, we also would not be in a situation to be wrecking the planet. So our dangers are in a way also the reverse side of our successes. But that fact also is a reason for hope. I'm going to argue that we have the tools and the knowledge to find our way through these challenges and that it is a question of organization, capacity, and determination, and I would say fundamentally a moral question, more than an economic question or even a political question, of how we proceed in this century. The problems that I'm going to talk about this evening, ladies and gentlemen, are unique to our generation. So this is a special challenge for us. We are the first generation that can end extreme poverty. We are the first generation that can utterly wreck the planet through environmental degradation. It's quite a responsibility, quite an exciting challenge for us, but one that unfortunately we haven't properly recognized yet. We are, in a way, the first generation living in a truly global society. This is also a phenomenon that we are clearly not quite ready for, psychologically, emotionally, institutionally, politically. But if you look at this interesting graphic representation of the world, the blue lines are the shipping lines, and the white lines are the airline connections, and the green are the roads uh, on the world map. What they show is a fully interconnected world, of course. And the world has been connected in one way or another for thousands of years. And with the voyages of discovery of Vasco da Gama and Columbus, the world was put together in ocean travel already 500 years ago. But the intensity of the interconnections waited for the information age. 
and the age of aviation and other marvels that link us together economically, socially, by disease transmission, technologically, in production systems, in financial systems, in a shared climate context with an intensity that we have never experienced before. And sustainable development is a field, a way of thinking that is required in this wholly connected world. We didn't need this field beforehand. We were warned about it 40 years ago in a, the first World Summit in Stockholm with the famous book, The Limits to Growth, in 1972, which for me is quite interesting. That was the year I studied freshman economics at college. And I was told as we were assigned that book, don't worry about it, it's not right. Markets will solve the problem. Now I know a little bit. 42 years later, I'm here to tell you markets will not solve the problem. Markets can help in certain ways, but they will not solve this problem. We have to solve the problem through joint action, through decision making about the value of our future. I'll refer back to a statement a little over half a century ago, which really defined the paradox of our time. And I will refer to the words of President John F. Kennedy. The many friends of mine who are here today know that I like to quote President Kennedy. Uh, he had a way with words and a way with leadership that we remember half a century later. And he said already in his inaugural address, for man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. And of course, in his thousand days as the presidency, we came as close as ever in human history to the disaster of nearly abolishing all forms of human life in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And it was Kennedy's wonderful leadership together with Nik Nikita Khrushchev a half a century ago that helped to pull the world back from the nuclear brink. 50 years later, this statement, this paradox, that we can end literally all of human poverty on this planet and at the same time that we are capable through bad judgment, indirection, lack of insight, lack of clear shared moral purpose of saving a planet, this remains true. Today, the threats are a little bit less about nuclear confrontation, though I have to say it's stunning to be living in a Cold War shock this week of a kind that we thought did not exist anymore, and yet we feel back in the Cold War this week. It shows that even the more traditional risks have not gone away. But what's new 50 years later is that our capacity to destroy all forms of human life, and by the way, millions of other species while we're at it, in what is sometimes called the sixth great extinction, is more about the inadvertence of our impacts on the physical planet, the ecosystems, biodiversity, the ocean chemistry, the atmospheric chemistry, and, of course, the climate system of the planet. That's pretty good for one species, you got to admit. To take over Earth's systems in this way, in this fundamental way. No single species ever before in Earth's history has had that impact, but we don't know how to manage it. We're called the driver of Earth change now, but I don't think we're driving with our eyes open. And so the question of how we can choose the better side of this equation, how we can choose to end all forms of human poverty and at the same time choose to save the planet is really the subject of sustainable development. We live at a time of much good news and it's worth 
reminding ourselves of that because, of course, the bad news comes enough that uh, we probably don't need reminding of all of the bad news. But we live in an age where ancient scourges of disease, early death, and extreme poverty and hunger are being brought under control. We see ever more passionately the places where that's not the case, but we should observe that in the world taken as a whole, there is considerable progress, even dramatic progress. If you look back just to 1990, 24 years ago, and measure the rate of extreme poverty in the developing countries, as the World Bank does, meaning living under a poverty line which is defined right now as $1.25 per person per day. The poverty rate in the developing countries was on the order of about 43% best estimate. By 2010, that poverty rate had declined to 21%. As of now, though we're four years waiting for the next round of data collection by the World Bank, we could guess that the poverty rate has declined to perhaps 17 or 18 percent. That's still over a billion people, but the proportions have come down sharply. And the wonderful news is that even in sub-Saharan Africa, which is the epicenter of extreme poverty on the planet, poverty rates are falling, and a continent that was mired in economic decline or stagnation for decades is now the second fastest growing region of the developing world behind developing countries of Asia. This is positive news and it makes it absolutely realistic to take President Kennedy's point that we could choose to end extreme poverty. And it's notable, ladies and gentlemen, that the World Bank Development Committee, which is the governing policy board of the World Bank, at its meeting last April, voted to make ending extreme poverty the bank's mission by the year 2030. So for the first time, they took a timeline. Because if you draw this line with continuing extrapolation and add in some decent global behavior to help the poor countries, it's quite possible to see the end of extreme poverty. Not all poverty, not relative poverty, not poverty of $2 a day, which would feel very poor to us, but the kind of extreme poverty that kills is indeed coming down and could be brought to an end by our generation. One of the reasons and one of the uh, points of most optimism for us is the well-known phenomenon depicted here, Moore's Law. We're living in an age of breathtaking technological advance. That has been true, I think, for every generation since 1776 when Mr. James Watt brought out his new steam engine and changed humanity forever. Each generation has had a wave of technological change, starting with the steam era, and then advances based on steam, rail, uh, and uh, uh, ocean uh, steamers, uh, and then the great breakthroughs of electrification, the internal combustion engine, aviation, gas turbines, the nuclear age, the modern computer age, which was given birth intellectually, one could say, in the 19th century, but really in the 1930s and 1940s by Turing and John von Neumann, and then given life in real computers by the early 1950s, at which point some of you may know the president of IBM said in 1952, computers, we'll only need two or three of them in the United States. We won't need more than that. But in 1965, after the discovery of the semiconductor, how to place the newly found transistors onto a, a circuit board in an integrated circuit, 
Gordon Moore, who was then the president CEO of Intel, in the lead of new integrated circuitry, observed that for the last eight years, the concentration of transistors in the integrated circuit was doubling every 18 to 24 months. And doubling is a big thing. Geometric growth of that rate is absolutely astounding. And so he said there have been four doublings in the past. That's two to the fourth, or a 16-fold improvement in integrated circuitry since their invention in 1957. And Moore stuck his neck out and said this could happen for another decade, five more doublings, another 32-fold increase. And of course, the miracle of our time is that that doubling every two years has continued not for another 10 years, but for another 49 years since Moore wrote his article. We've had about 29 doublings of the transistor count on integrated circuits. And the graph ends up looking like this. It looks like zero for a very long time. Uh, and then it shoots straight up. In essence, we have a one billion fold improvement in the capacity to process, store, and transmit information. And since almost everything of value can be digitized in the sense of the underlying knowledge, whether it's the electronic books, whether it's our text messages, whether it's the movies that we stream on our phones, or whether it's the human genome that can now be uh, decoded uh, for a cost of under $1,000 per uh, human genome, we are sitting on a mountain of technological potential that is our generation's turn of one of the greatest technological advances in history. Anyone who is pessimistic about technology now who says nothing major has been discovered doesn't get it, in my view because the digital revolution is a fundamentally significant revolution that can penetrate every single sector of the economy. It gives rise to nanotechnologies. It gives rise to smart grids. It gives rise to smart medicine. It gives rise to smart education. It gives rise to smart and safer transport. And we've only just begun because what we've gotten really good at is talking to each other on the phone, texting each other, sending messages, and streaming movies. Not bad, but not exactly the solution to all our problems yet. And that is another reason for optimism. This is the last word of optimism for a while. Because the world's also a mess. And for a while, every stop I took, as my wife and I visited places around the world as part of the United Nations work, there were riots, kids out on the street, barricades. The pictures look identical, and I could have packed a dozen more cities around the world with youth confronting police in recent years. I remember we arrived in Rio last summer. I called my mother, as I like to do when I arrive someplace. Mom, I'm in Rio. She said, oh my God, there are riots there. I said, no, Mom, it's 10 million people. Don't worry, we're on the beach. It's beautiful. We turned the corner, tear gas, police, uh, thousands of people running towards us. So we ran back to the hotel, and I did not call my mother back. Uh, the fact of the matter is there's a lot of unrest, there's a lot of unhappiness, there is a lot of rising inequality in the world. We are not living in an age where these technological breakthroughs are making every part of society feel the advances. In fact, many of these technological advances in the short term are enormously dislocating. Jobs that once existed don't exist anymore. Robots absolutely are taking over the assembly line. Voice recognition will take over many, many kinds of services in the coming years. 
And those jobs that aren't taken over are sometimes moved halfway around the world because coordinating a large enterprise is now a vastly simpler operation than it was even 10 or 20 years ago in terms of the logistics, the data management, the specifications of production uh, and so forth. And so this growing inequality and the sense of unrest is a sign of deep transformation and deep dislocation. And interestingly, and it's not against economic theory, there are clear signs of strong economic growth leading to impoverishment of some parts of the population and super increases of wealth of other parts of the population. So the income distribution is absolutely startling in the extent of the widening gaps. Forbes magazine, which celebrates billionaires, and I celebrate billionaires when they give a lot of money to IASA and to other great causes, uh, issued its annual report this last week. I want you to keep it in your mind. I'll come back to it. There are 1,642 billionaires in the world, and the combined worth is now $6.4 trillion. And so this is a capacity to solve problems that is completely unprecedented. But it has to be put to good use. And this is a great challenge that we face. But here's another problem of our time. If social inclusion seems to be running backward, the environmental crisis seems to be rapidly rising waters. This is my own city, New York City. When we had our superstorm a year and a half ago, my colleagues at the Earth Institute had been begging the mayors of New York for 10 years, we're going to flood, we're going to flood, we're going to flood. And they were saying it because the ocean level off the coast of New York City had increased by a third of a meter during the past century. So a major storm was going to lead to unprecedented storm surges. They even identified which subways were going to flood where. It's a testimony to our difficulties, ladies and gentlemen, that the major hospitals of New York City had their generator backups in the basements. Just as Fukushima had its backup generator on the ground level, the major cities of New York had to be, the major hospitals of New York City had to be evacuated. Patients carried out of the ICU. The city did not get up and running for more than a month even to get the lights turned on below 32nd Street as the power generators had all exploded in the midst of the storm. This is New York City. It prides itself on being a sophisticated center of global capitalism. I will give credit to Goldman Sachs. There was one building, down, no relation to this Sachs, by the way, uh, that I've discovered, but I keep looking. Uh, there was one building lit up below 32nd Street. That was the Goldman Sachs Tower. They had their generators above the ground floor. But all the rest was dark, and it was dark, actually, for weeks. But this is uh, what Beijing looked like at the beginning of this year. Uh, it's no happier. Beijing had its floods last year, but this year it's had its choking, asphyxiating smog. With the P2.5, the particulates of, uh, that are uh, 2.5 microns or smaller, so concentrated that it's 30 times the concentration of a smoking lounge at an airport. The WHO statement is, don't be in air like this, period. Don't go outside. And Beijing, of course, is experiencing this on a regular basis now. Because while China has had the most successful economic development in history, it now has about the dirtiest air and the dirtiest water of major cities anywhere in the world. But when it comes to the environmental crisis, 
it's perhaps what we can't see that, it's, that is threatening us even more. And that is that behind the coal burning that is the ultimate fact of this smog is, of course, the carbon dioxide emissions that are fundamentally deranging the global climate system. China is now by far the leading emitter of greenhouse gases, not on a per capita basis where the U.S. still remains the biggest emitter of any large economy, but on an absolute basis, China emits 40 percent more greenhouse gases than the United States, which is number two. And the future of the world depends on choices that China makes. Of course, China's choices depend on what choices the United States and Europe and other countries make. We are so completely intertwined in our future fate, there is no way anymore and no time left to point a finger and say, you do it, we'll see how you do. As I'm sure many people here know, the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere reached 400 parts per million this year, which is the first time that carbon dioxide has been so concentrated in the atmosphere for three million years. We are completely outside of the human experience. We will reach temperatures on the current trajectory that the Earth has not seen in any time close to human history, in fact, has not experienced for millions and millions of years. And all signs are that this will be a devastating threat to the survival of many people on the planet, to the ability to grow crops, and when all the feedbacks are finished, even to the survival of great cities on rivers or on coasts, and I know a few, because the chances of major sea level increase of several meters are absolutely real. We just don't know the time scale for that, but we do know that whenever carbon dioxide has been at 400 parts per million in the past, when all of the feedbacks are done, the melting of the sea ice, the cracking up of, uh, of uh, uh, ice shelves and so forth, the thermal expansion, the change of albedo, which is the reflectance of the planet, when all of those feedbacks are finished, the sea level in the past at this concentration of CO2 has been five to 10 meters higher than it is today. We are gambling dramatically with the future. And as you know from the daily news, we hardly know it and hardly accept that fact. But here's another picture of our time. The violence, the wars, our seeming inability, even in this remarkable and advanced technological age to move beyond the primitive, complete destruction of each other, though we have advanced technologies as never before to carry this out. When I wrote about this a few years ago, the great uh, sociobiologist, the greatest biologist in my view, uh, uh, living today, uh, Professor E.O. Wilson, uh, in his foreword said that humanity has stumbled into the modern era with our Stone Age emotions, medieval institutions, and near godlike 21st century technologies. Uh, and one can think about this, that our human nature uh, was uh, formed uh, in the uh, ancient past somewhere on the African savanna, no doubt. And our institutions are hundreds of years old in their formation, and our technology has moved ahead. We can destroy of course, completely and fully. We can destroy with unprecedented capacity. Syria, which uh, was two years ago at peace, has now suffered more than 130,000 deaths in what is an absolutely tragic and useless conflict, fed very much from the outside, I'm afraid. Why do I mention Syria in this context? Because to understand any of the challenges that I've discussed, whether it's climate change or inequality or even war and peace, we need a sustainable development lens. We need a way of thinking to help us understand these 
complex phenomena and complex challenges. Sustainable development, in my view, means two things. They're related, but they're distinct. The first is a way of thinking. It's an analytical process. It says to take an integrated, holistic approach to complex, interconnected systems. So it's systems dynamics of complex human and physical systems. That's what sustainable development is as a field of study. It's also an idea of a moral or ethical base, a so-called normative concept, that we should aim for a balanced society that balances economic, social, and environmental objectives. So it's both a way to study problems and it's a way to address problems if used properly. It's both what we would call a positive field of analysis and a normative field of ethical discourse and framework. Now what I find useful is to regard any problem from a variety of perspectives. First is a techno-economic perspective at the top to understand the underlying technological drivers. Without question, technological change is the most fundamental driver of economic change. And we've been in a period of 200 years of rapid technological change, and we have more ahead. We have to understand how technology and economic institutions interact to produce economic and social change. The second interconnected system is the Earth system. This is the complex system of food webs, chemical cycles like nitrogen uh, or phosphorus cycles, the hydrologic cycle, the formation of the climate system. These are very complex biophysical systems that can be deranged and that are subject to abrupt change to tipping points and therefore, from our point of view as a species that is a biological species, to potential disaster. If our fruit, food does not grow, we have a big problem. If the climate puts the ecosystems and the biodiversity outside the range we know on which we base our lives, livelihoods, nutrition, and safety from physical hazards, we have a huge problem. A third aspect is the social dynamics. What do I mean by social dynamics? I mean the extent of trust and cooperation within society, whether people regard each other as cooperative partners or whether they regard each other as deadly foes. And we know that social dynamics has its own tipping point. Every time there is a bloodbath, as there is in Syria right now, or as there was in Rwanda, and one can name countless examples, the first bit of the diagnosis is these were communities that lived side by side for centuries, and suddenly they're killing each other. And we need to understand those threats and what it is that keeps the social fabric together or what it is that can pull it apart. We have in the United States a very dramatic decline of social trust in the last 40 years. That's not my observation, that's what the data tell us. If you ask Americans, do you trust your neighbor? The answer these days is basically no. Do you trust your congressman? Hell no. Are you crazy? And so the loss of confidence in institutions and in neighbors is part of the social dynamic. We don't systematically report this on a quarterly basis, but we should. Just like we take the temperature of gross domestic product each quarter, we should take the temperature of social trust and examine what that means and reflect on it for our societies, because the societies not only the economies, but the societies are under stress. And finally is governance, the institutions of power. And this is governance of political systems and governance of business systems. Business systems in many ways are the most powerful systems in the world today. They're the most active, 
They are the most global, they are the most capable, and generally governments are scared of them. And so the business governance, the corporate governance, and the political governance are fundamental dimensions. Now, when we have a problem like Syria or like climate change, we need, sorry, I was going to show you for Syria, we need to understand how to view a crisis like the Syrian crisis from that multiplicity of perspectives. We generally don't. If you read a newspaper article, if you ask certainly a politician, if you ask a diplomat, if you ask a general, you will get unidimensional answers to this question. And generally, you will forget to ask an agronomist or an ecologist. One of the notable aspects of the Syria crisis, for example, was that Syria had its worst droughts of modern history over the course of the decade before the explosion of violence. There has been a massive drying of the whole Mediterranean basin. This is one of the great disasters underway from human-induced climate change. The Mediterranean basin is at the uh, receiving end of the Hadley cell. The air cycle that rises at the equator and falls over the subtropics with dry air falls over the Mediterranean basin, and the dry zone is expanding because of the intensification of the convective cycle due to warming. And almost every climate model says the Mediterranean, the Eastern Mediterranean, places like Israel and Palestine, uh, Egypt, North Africa, and Syria can expect a significant climate shock of profound significance when you are scarce of water and you lose the water you have. and You can't grow the crops and you lose the food security, which is what happened in Syria this past 10 years. The consequences can be explosive. One of the main aspects of complex systems is that their responses are highly nonlinear. You get calm, 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 grumbling, grumbling, civil war. You get calm, 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 calm. Some fluctuations in the financial markets, financial panic. You get nutrients flowing into a lake change, change, suddenly, eutrophication, algal bloom, hypoxia. Complex systems have tipping points. We don't watch the underlying dynamics very carefully, especially the underlying social dynamics. And the world does not care very much about poor people. And poor people are the ones closest to disaster, of course, by definition. And when poor, hungry people face calamity, bad things happen. I can put that as Sachs's not very original theorem number one. You push poor people to the wall with hunger, you'll get mass migration, you'll get disease epidemics, you'll get violence, you'll get Al-Qaeda moving in. Many things can happen. But what you won't get is quiet. And the unrest can happen quickly. And that's what has happened in Syria. Of course, when uh, the droughts occurred, there was very little interest in them. But a lot of the poor farmers and in ethnic groups that were out of the Alawite coalition of Bashar al-Assad moved closer to cities, disrupted the environment, uh, caused local tensions and conflict, and then were part of the explosion uh, of unrest when the so-called Arab Spring broke out and protests started in Syria as well. The government cracked down, as governments do, and then the outside world intervened and added in arms, added in 
uh, a big escalation, uh, said uh, this government needs to be toppled. President Obama called for Assad to go, which is very odd and not very safe for one leader to say of another, because that is what creates spiraling war. And so we have a disaster on our hands. And I raise this not only to illustrate how ecological crises can turn into mass violence, this perhaps is known, and how we can have unexpected disasters. We should be careful with this world. We don't have to push the world always just to the boundary, to the tautness, to the view that nothing much serious can happen. And especially this year, the 100th anniversary of the beginning of World War I, and especially in this region, of course, this is understood. Don't play with fire because we're not capable of mastering the so-called nonlinearities, as a systems theorist would call them, or what we would call the explosive dynamics that lead to uncontrolled violence and war. We're pushing the earth and our societies to limits that are not safe. And that is what sustainable development thinking should be about. I skipped, uh, by the way, a graph, just an illustration of the network of international banks that was drawn in 2007. It's a connected graph, as it's called. Uh, each bank is a node of this graph. Each uh, edge uh, between two banks uh, is an interbank line. When you have a connected graph like this, the dynamics of that, uh, of that network can be highly unpredictable. When Lehman Brothers failed on September 14, 2008, that network stopped provision of interbank liquidity. So all of those edges disappeared. The banks found themselves alone. And that caused a catastrophic, immediate drop of global production. It was a financial panic. It is so little understood, by the way, that when the Federal Open Market Committee records were just released last month showing what the Fed, that is the central bank of the US experts said, two days after the Lehman collapse at their meeting on September 16, 2008, they didn't have a clue as to what had just happened, even though it was the most cataclysmic financial collapse since Credit Anstalt and Bank of the U.S. and others failed in the Great Depression. And they didn't know it. And the chief economist of the Fed two days after Lehman said, we maintain our previous forecast of weakness in the fourth quarter and then a recovery in the beginning of 2009. If you're not worried yet, please start worrying. This is a cue. I'm telling you, we don't know what we're doing, so don't push the systems beyond what we know because we risk major, even catastrophic consequences as a result. We're just not good at these things. There's Lehman Brothers with its shingle being uh, taken uh, down in, uh, I guess, at Christie's auction house uh, ap afterwards. Uh, and this is uh, the explosions of, of unrest, this one uh, in the United States. So I believe that the essence of this challenge, which fundamentally comes from a crowded, interconnected world of rapid technological change, that's the characteristics, crowded, interconnected, rapid technological change, and right up against planetary biophysical boundaries, is a world at one side of great possibility because of the technological capacities that we have, and at the other side, a world of profound risk. What should one do in such a circumstance? In my opinion, it wouldn't hurt to think a little bit. That would be my main recommendation to the world. Think a little bit. 
Unfortunately, in the United States, we've given up on that. I would just say in Washington. There is no thinking in Washington. There's plenty of money. There's plenty of spin. There's plenty of lobbyists. There's plenty of congressmen calling day by day their campaign backers, but there is no thinking. We don't have an energy plan in the United States, for example. Not because we don't have hundreds of wonderful world-class energy experts, but because the politicians don't see fit to think it could be dangerous. One might have to take a holistic view of these complicated questions. Rather, we are treated every day to profound misinformation and I would say systematic propaganda. And that is basically true of the world of Rupert Murdoch, wherever that may be. I think you're mostly free of that world. But if you're in London, or in New York, or in Australia, or in other places, you're bombarded by daily propaganda. That all is well, there are no risks, climate change is a hoax, no need to do anything, keep buying fossil fuel, everything is okay, nothing to do. And so when I say we need to think, I mean it quite seriously. We need deep thinking and we need another word that in the United States became absolutely a prohibited word and that is planning. When the Soviet Union uh, ended uh, in December 1991, the conclusion in the United States was we don't have to think ahead anymore, the market will do it for us. We don't need any planning. Planning is what killed the Soviet Union. We shouldn't plan ahead. This is absolutely pervasive in its thinking and it's also absolutely wrong-headed. If markets could solve such problems, that would be wonderful because markets are great institutions, decentralized, self-organizing, but markets cannot solve ecological crises unless they're corrected, unless the incentives are right, unless the, uh, the underlying motivations are right. But when the atmosphere is free dumping ground for carbon dioxide, how could they be right? And if the argument is, well, we should correct them, and the answer is, we'll let the market do it, which is the American answer so far, we obviously are in a profound confusion of category. So what are the things we need to think about and plan ahead and strategy? I would say that the following are the most important. How to invest in young people, because that is the core of the challenge of income distribution. Young people without skills have no foothold in the world economy anywhere, whether it's New York City uh, or in Mali or in Syria. Young people with skills will have a foothold. So the education is crucial, but that by itself is a complex subsystem. It starts with the safety, the physical safety of a child at birth, a low stress environment, safety of the mother during pregnancy. In fact, we now know even the parental health epigenetically can affect the child's health, not genetically, but epigenetically, in other words, Bad experiences of parents can be passed in ways that science doesn't understand, even a generation or two generations later. But young people need help to be able to grow up healthy, productive, and with the potential of prosperous contributors to society. We need fundamentally sustainable technologies for deep decarbonization of the energy system. This by itself is worth, of course, a major discussion, but I would summarize it the following way. Every country needs an energy vending. That's the simple truth. Germany should not lose heart or lose course or lose hope. It's on the right track. A deep transformation to renewable energy or other low carbon energy. I'm not in agreement with every detail. I think carbon capture and sequestration might well play a role in the future. Uh, the German government and people are not in favor of that. 
I actually believe, and I know this may surprise some people, I believe that nuclear energy should play a role in the future in a low carbon world energy system. But the point is not the particulars, which is for each country to choose. The point is that every country needs a strategy of deep decarbonization. It may surprise some of you to realize that it's actually the agricultural systems of the world that are even the greatest human impact on the planet. But then when you think about it, that's why land is cleared, that's why forests are cleared. Uh, the human appropriation of what's called the net primary production, the photosynthesis on the planet, has reached nearly 50% of all photosynthetic potential on the planet. We are eating the other species off the planet, basically. And we are clearing land and destroying habitat and acidifying the oceans and uh, overfishing the fisheries to the point of mass extinction. And so a sustainable agricultural system is a fundamental need for the world. It's quite complicated. One part of it is our personal behavior. We know that a heavy beef diet is a major part of the ecological stress. Every kilo of beef is 10 to 15 kilograms of feed grain uh, that are used to produce that. And you can imagine the multiplier effects, therefore, of fertilizer flows, water, land, and so forth. But it's not only diet. 30% of the world's food is lost in the transmission from farm to household use. Massive waste, massive loss. And farm practices are often not sustainable as well. So sustainable agriculture in a world of climate change is a fundamental theme. Well, let me skip the next one for, for one moment. Transparent global financial and tax systems, we don't have them now. The UK and the United States, and a few other countries, but mainly the UK during the uh, glory of empire and the power of the city of London, has created an archipelago worldwide of tax evasion by design. There are trillions of dollars held in the Cayman Islands or the British Virgin Islands or Bermuda. These are little islands where a local might sit on 600 corporate boards because these are boards of convenience, obviously. These are to hide money. How can the world take seriously any of these challenges when there is so little accountability? And so this kind of abuse stares us in the face and our senators in the United States absolutely are opposed to doing anything because their biggest campaign funders are hedge fund owners. And the hedge funds are all incorporated in the Caribbean. It's quite a world. Keeps the restaurants of Manhattan packed, I can tell you. But it doesn't lead to a lot of other problem solving. We could actually think about ending extreme poverty in a very specific, targeted way because the problems of the poor are not ethereal, mysterious problems. They're very practical, down-to-earth problems. Disease control, kids in school, water and sanitation, roads, power. People are trapped in poverty. They know what to do to get out of poverty, but they can't afford it, and they're not creditworthy to finance their way out of it. And yet, I can tell you those uh, wealth in this planet easily could solve these problems within the coming generation. And we know that less than 1% of the income of the high income world per year, less than 0.7 of 1%, would be ample to close the financing gaps on infrastructure, health, education, and other critical areas so that people would not be dying by the millions every year because they're too poor to stay alive. And of course, uh, the final, uh, it's, I don't have an answer to it. That one's more than 2,000 years old. We don't have stable systems of political alteration. The biggest problems that come are when individuals identify themselves as the state. And that, not the specifics of the political system, but the lack of regular turnover 
is the biggest challenge that we face. When Mr. Gaddafi had stayed 49 years in power, that's a little long. Mr. Mugabe, a little bit too long, and so forth. And so finding norms internationally that require a regular alternation of power, not specific rules dictated by one country to another, but also not the personalization of the state is absolutely essential. Finally, in the middle, I say well-being, not GDP. We should spend a little bit of time that Aristotle pondered 2,400 years ago. He did a good job, by the way. He asked the question, what is the human good? Why do we flourish? And his answer was, by the way, we should be virtuous. That's the way to be good. That's the way to happiness, is through personal virtue, that people strive to be part of a healthy society. Because for Aristotle, interestingly, the society came first. He said, man is a social animal. So the society's first, and then we as individuals need to train ourselves to live decently within the society. That's what virtue ethics is. I subscribe to that idea as a way out and also as a way that can improve our well-being. But the question of what is it that gives us well-being now is being addressed more scientifically. We can ask people about their happiness. It turns out money counts, but it is far from everything. People want to live in societies of trust. People want to live in places where they can trust their government. People want to live in societies where there are social support systems. So this is important for us to know because it gives us guidance on how to think more fundamentally about these questions. I'll close with some guidance of President Kennedy, given uh, that it's a half century anniversary of his success in helping to make peace on the planet after near disaster. I believe what he and Nikita Khrushchev did in 1963 in negotiating a partial nuclear test ban treaty was one of the most consequential acts of leadership of our time because it showed even two countries that ostensibly the thought was were out to kill each other knew at the top that living together was the ultimate aim. And Kennedy displayed the vision to solve a great problem. And he took a major risk and a major challenge. Some people say it cost him his life. He said to the American people, if we want to make peace with the Soviet Union, the challenge is on us, not on them. We have to change our attitudes. He called on Americans to change Americans' attitudes. I've never heard or seen another president argue in that way, that the burden is the internal burden, not the burden of the adversary, but the burden internally to respect the counterpart. And he defined some crucial issues of leadership that I want to share in closing. First, in my favorite speech of President Kennedy called his peace speech, which was an American University commencement address, June 10, 1963. And I have to urge all of you, listen online. You'll enjoy it. It's a wonderful half an hour to listen to great leadership and wonderful eloquence uh, at work. He talked about how to help solve a great problem. And he said, first of all, by defining our goal more clearly, by making it seem more manageable and less remote, we help all people to see it, to draw hope from it, and to move irresistibly toward it. The point is he believed in setting clear goals. And he said by setting clear goals and helping people to understand how to meet those goals, that is how to inspire people to draw hope from these goals. And so I think it's not inconsequential that the world is engaged in setting sustainable development goals, which are supposed to be adopted by world leaders in September 2015. I won't go through this list 
except to say, and this will be posted, the presentation will be available on IASA's website, except to say that Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has honored me and asked me to direct a process called the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, a global network of universities and think tanks, and we're very, very proud that Pavel Kabat is on the leadership uh, of this uh, network and also that IASA is a core partner of this network and we are a partner of IASA with its own networks. But this network has recommended what might be sustainable development goals. And this is an illustrative list. It says the world should set clear goals on education, on health, on climate change, on biodiversity, on urban sustainability, on sustainable agriculture. And then to show how could we achieve those goals. It's logical. Of course, politics is not meant to be logical. Politics is about power. It's not necessarily about logic. But our survival is about logic. And so we need to be more logical about the goal setting and then about showing how these goals are manageable and practicable, how we could have a pathway to deep decarbonization or a pathway to ending extreme poverty. Kennedy also, of course, in this magical moment, pointed his finger to the moon and said, we will send a man to the moon and bring him back safely to Earth by the end of the decade. He said that in Congress in early 1961. I'll have you know something. I don't know whether his political advisors fainted at that moment, but I can tell you that NASA had no plan yet to get a person to the moon and back in 1961. It's amazing. If you go back to NASA, at that point they had three strategies drawn out in almost a schematic. Should we have a lunar module? Should we have a direct, uh, a, a direct uh, launch to the moon? Should uh, we have an Earth module, which then goes to the moon? Three fundamentally different plans. Just to show you Kennedy's leadership and the spirit of it, he said, we will go to the moon. And then, of course, encouraged American people to get behind it. I grew up with that. I'm sure some of you did as well. But I listened for one decade to the radio or watching television every single mission. Nothing could be more inspiring, actually, of a childhood. And when he was asked, why? Why do we go to the moon? He made this famous line that, again, no president since then has said, we choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win, and the others too. We choose to go to the moon not because it is easy, but because it is hard. What about choosing to save the planet, choosing to save other species? choosing to end extreme poverty? Do we need absolutely the guarantee of exactly how to do it? My academic colleagues are often on my back. How do you know this? How do you know that? Have you done randomized control trials on this yet? And the answer is no. But we don't have to do trials on everything to know how to reduce malaria or how to treat people with AIDS or how to preserve ecosystems. Of course, trials can help, but the idea that everything has to be guaranteed beforehand, we would accomplish nothing in this world, ladies and gentlemen. And Kennedy was completely right about this. And finally, the spirit of all of this. The spirit of all of this is an interconnected planet, a single global society. Why are we at each other's throats? We're all absolutely in the same fix. We have to draw our attention away from the short-term headlines and conflicts. We don't have time for them anymore. 
We can't afford these wars. They're insane. They are solving nothing. They are accomplishing nothing. And we have lost crucial time. Kennedy's genius in negotiating the Nuclear Partial Test Ban Treaty, and by the way, I want to give massive credit to Nikita Khrushchev as well, because it was two partners who had stared into the abyss and realized that they were the partners, not the adversaries, and that the adversaries were the hardliners that surrounded them. Because President Kennedy realized, he said, you know, Chairman Khrushchev is in the same position I'm in, advisors that would have advised on ending the world. And so they realized they were partners with each other on the path to peace. And what I find most amazing about that episode and the key to global problem solving is the common humanity, the sense that we, and the reality that we are all in this together, and that in any conflict, the other side are human beings. They're not irrational, they're not crazy. Almost all the time, they have their interests, they have their differences. But a military approach is almost bound to fail. And so Kennedy said, as his basic strategy, this wonderful line of his in this peace speech, so let us not be blind to our differences, but let us also direct attention to our common interests and to the means by which those differences can be resolved. And if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air, we all cherish our children's futures, and we are all mortal. Thank you very much.